Thank you so much, Martin. And thank you also, especially to the Royal Institution and the Grantham Institute for Climate Change and the Environment at Imperial College for the opportunity to view the power and influence behind competing climate change agendas through the lens of social justice. To this end, we will be advocating for the democratization of climate change policymaking, building bridges between grassroots and micro communities represented by some of our panelists here today, like Truen and Cameron, with those occupying positions of greater agency, both within our audience and including our panelists, Alyssa and Mustafa. I've had a varied career, as Martin had mentioned, including sustainability entrepreneurship. And as a historian of nationalism, my research has focused on how diverse populations within developing nation states have come together to create national identity. With regard to the topic of climate change influence and power, I'm an engaged observer of issues relating to international alignment around frameworks like the Paris Agreement and UN SDGs, resource nationalism, and the geopolitics of natural resource access. Today, we are progressing a vision of climate change policy representing democratic values, inclusion, and diversity with the objective to foster a closer correlation between constituencies forging climate change policy and the people. That is to say, each and every one of us across the globe who will be affected by the decisions made within the chambers of power, including the UN, and also including COP26, which is happening here in the UK in Glasgow next month. As the people, we are asserting our rights as women, people of different ethnicities, genders, and skin tones, as well as the disabled who have been completely marginalized and overlooked to contribute to climate change discourse on an equal basis. As a highly educated, privileged, and able-bodied white woman, I can only imagine what it must be like for somebody who is wheelchair bound, who is hearing impaired, blind, under-resourced, impoverished, without any media access or literacy to confront a climate catastrophe like a tsunami, a drought, hurricane. And it's really these conditions which will affect matters of human survival, right? And even the most powerful of all climate change influencers like BlackRock's Larry Fink have been calling upon government and society for urgent and swift action. But which government in which society? This is a global problem. And so to this end, I would like to cite the geopolitical study group's thesis of the right scope of global governments, which promotes a healthy respect for the discrete policy space of national government dovetailing with international mandates, which I agree is the key to achieving a global public good, such as climate change amelioration. Towards the greater democratization of discourse and policy making, I'm very pleased to be able to introduce our panelists for climate change, power and influence, starting with Alyssa Gilbert, who is the Director of Policy and Translation at the Grantham Institute for Climate Change and the Environment at Imperial College, who will be discussing the science behind climate change policy. Truen Resterich, the CEO and co-founder of environmental charity Hubbub, who will be providing a specifically UK context for our panel today, drawing from stories of climate change engagement and activism from his constituents' communities. Mustafa Gay here from the UN, representing the Green Jobs Program at the International Labor Organization in Geneva, who will shine a light on how global climate change policy is created and affected. And hopefully Cameron Malik, CEO of Disability Rights UK, who will be talking about how climate change particularly impacts the disabled and also sharing his views on how the disabled can achieve greater parity power and influence in the climate change arena. 
So I hope you'll join me in welcoming our panelists this evening. Martin, back to you. Oh, thanks, Colleen. Um, yeah, so it's just uh, my absolute pleasure to introduce uh, Alyssa Gilbert, who is our, our first speaker this evening. Um, as uh, you said, hang on. I do apologize. Uh, as, uh, as I think you said earlier, uh, Alyssa is the um, Director of Policy and Translation at the Grantham Institute for Climate Change and the Environment, and she connects relevant research across the university with policymakers and businesses. And together with the team at Grantham and Academics across Imperial, she delivers outputs for those audiences ranging from briefing papers through to workshops and events. She's expanded these outputs to include digital learning through a massive open online course on clean power and an art and science exhibition, amongst other processes. So, uh, Alyssa, it's over to you. Great. Thanks so much, Martin. Um, and thank you, Colleen. Um, so I thought I'd start with the science. Of course, as we know, the Royal Institution is an organization that promotes science. Um, and of course, understanding our understanding of the climate change challenge really comes from a scientific background. So we've had um, for really hundreds of years, and actually we've had evidence on, on how, our, how our activities and our greenhouse gas emissions affect the climate. And that has been established in physics for several hundred years. And in fact, um, if you ever have a chance to go visit hopefully you know some of you in the UK can come and visit the Royal Institution's home in Mayfair. They, they actually have some of the actual equipment that Tyndall, who was one of the scientists who helped us understand the greenhouse gas effect, actually used in his experiments. So in terms of climate change, the evidence from physics is now long established. And more recently, um, but still for some time, we've had a, a group of scientists in the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And these are scientists who come together, actually hundreds of scientists who come together um, every four or five or six years to review the latest peer-reviewed uh, scientific evidence for how humans are affecting the climate and how the climate is currently changing and how those changes can affect or impact different parts of the world at a basic level, helping us understand how the global temperature is changing on average, but also helping us understand the regional differences between those temperature changes, the knock-on effects on precipitation and other um, weather, and therefore the impacts of those on people that are exposed to those impacts and, and, and people who have varying degrees of vulnerability as well as natural systems. As well as helping us understand the problem, science and engineering has really helped us understand the solutions. So we now recognize that we have to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And to do that, we have a variety of technologies and processes that we could implement. Some of them you might consider quite simple, like energy efficiency, insulation for your home, um, better building and then future-proofing those buildings so it can go more complex. And some of those are, are you know, on the edge of just being developed. People like to, to talk about the kind of technologies that we need to advance green aviation or shipping, for example. So science and engineering have already helped us understand some of the solutions and are going to continue to help us understand those solutions. They also give us the analytical skills, um, data analysis, computer modeling that help us understand overall pathways. So we can look in complex detail at the way in which we can reduce our greenhouse gas emissions in different parts of the world and what that means overall, um, what changes you could make for example, in transport in China, at the same time as we make different changes in industry in the UK and how that affects the speed at which we reach our climate change goals. Um, we can even use that modeling and that scientific understanding to look at how different people behave. We call that the agent, how might an individual behave and how does that relate to our pathway? Um, and we can also assess things like how different, different gases um, make a difference. We have short-lived greenhouse gases and longer-lived greenhouse gases. So there's really a lot that we can do um, with science and technology. At the same time, though, as I said, we've understood the climate change challenge for a long time now. Um, for hundreds of years, we've understood the greenhouse gas effect. But in the past 30 years, we've begun to understand what we need to do about it as people. Uh, and it's starting to become, it's pretty evident now that the time for just doing analysis is well over and it's time for action. Again, with our kind of analytical hats on using those skills and techniques I mentioned, um, we, we can understand things like what is the cheapest solution? What's the most technical, technically feasible solution? Um, and, you know, people who are looking at climate change pathways use, use terms that don't sound very sort of human, like um, techno-economic pathways and things like that. Um, so, so 
to a certain extent, the anal analysis can help us with that direction. But as well as us knowing that the time for action is now, we also know that it's absolutely urgent that we take action now um, to reach our, our climate change goals as internationally agreed in the Paris Agreement in 2015. Um, we need to um, reach net zero greenhouse gas emissions by the middle of this century. Um, and that means really significantly reducing or even having emissions by around 2030. Um, that means that it's pretty urgent. I mean, it's 2021, right? We've got less than a decade to make that scale of emissions if we're going to reach that target. Certainly, we need to move rapidly. Um, and so that means that we need to all get involved. Everyone needs to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. And we need to try lots of different things. So that means that although this analysis that we have about our technical options is important, we also need to understand how to bring people with us. If everybody needs to make those reductions and we need to do it quickly, then it's no good if we don't bring populations, workers, actually everybody with us in this journey. Otherwise, what will happen is people will react badly to changes, um, won't support them. And we actually won't have sustainability, not just in the sense of it being good for the environment, but actually durability and a lasting nature of the changes that we put in place. So step in the social sciences and the political sciences. We need to expand our research. We've got this research there, but how we use it and we recognize the value of it to deliver a rapid, but also sustained and fair action on climate change. So with that kind of background in mind and, and that thinking about the analytical basis that we need to take forward to deliver action on climate change, we can ask ourselves who's actually involved in these discussions that we see happening at the international climate change negotiations. So as Colleen mentioned, the international climate change negotiations are going to take place in Glasgow in really just a few weeks now in November this year. Um, and it's colloquially been known as COP26. COP26 stands for the Conference of the Parties. That means the Conference of the Parties to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. This is a global agreement framework that was set up nearly 30 years ago where countries around the world agreed that something had to be done globally and cooperatively about climate change. Once that agreement was made, all of the people in the agreement became the parties to the agreement, and they met every year to decide what we should do about it. Those meetings were called conferences. They're conferences of those parties, and that's what the meeting is going to be in November. The 26 means that it's the 26th such meeting. That could fill you with kind of slight horror because that means that we haven't got really as far as we would like to have got in the time. It should emphasize again the sense of urgency and the need for immediate action. These kind of negotiations, the meeting that we're having in Glasgow, is actually very structured. It has very clear governance, clear processes and protocols for agreeing approaches. What will come out of it will be a, a very clearly written document with articles, annexes, um, and official signatories. Um, and within that governance structure, there are parties, those are the countries that are represented, and there are also official representations from some, some outside sectors or sectors that are required to have representation, for example, youth. Um, and there's a space or a way in which Indigenous people, for example, can engage. However, that doesn't necessarily mean that that's a completely inclusive place where decisions are made. Um, whilst there's a structured governance structure, the dynamics between the parties themselves can really vary. Some parties are more powerful than others because of their geopolitical positions. They also tend to group together at these events into subgroups um, uh, of, of different parties who negotiate together, depending on who they're allied with, again, possibly in other places. Um, and, and those can um, emphasize existing power imbalances in the world, but they can also they can also break those. So, for example, in Paris, one of the ways in which a very successful, ambitious agreement was reached was a new coalition of parties, a, a high ambition coalition was forged between the very vulnerable small island nations and some of the wealthier developed countries who were willing to go further in their action. So whilst there's a certain structural imbalance, there can be flexibility to do something new and different there. There's also a lot of pressure at the moment to see, to, to, in, in recognition of the fact that it's not just international governments that need to make decisions, but we really need everyone to take action. It's now recognized that there needs to be a better place at the table in these international discussions for all of the different actors. They're known as non-state actors who have a very important role in delivering on climate change, but don't really have a representation or a way to be accounted for in this international framework that we have. So when the uh, negotiations take place in Glasgow, what you'll probably see is some statements and some 
outputs of what's happening between the parties, the governments at international level, but also statements and interesting outputs from these other so-called non-state actors who aren't officially at the negotiating table, but have a lot to deliver for, um, for uh, action on climate change. Um, and then just for, for, for the last couple of minutes, you know, I, I was talking a little bit there about the international governance structure, but arguably delivering action on climate change is then interpreting this global agreement where countries all make a commitment to do something at home into something national and then often very local. Um, and at the local level, it's also really important to make sure that we engage people to make sure that any decisions that are made, as I said earlier, are sustained and fair and supported by people. Um, we've started to experiment in different ways of, of how to engage people in those local actions. For example, the UK's experiment with deliberative democracy through citizens' assemblies on climate change. Um, and, you know, there's lots of uh, ideas of how action at a local level can really take on board these different things by acknowledging and taking account of the co-benefits of climate change action in terms of, for example, health gain um, to citizens, uh, making sure that we're very aware of context in the local setting um, and understanding and finding solutions to making sure that the transition to a low carbon resilient world is just and being honest about the challenges, but equally committed to the solutions. So I'll finish there just by saying that science, engineering, all of these technical disciplines have been vitally important to helping us understand the challenge of climate change and still have a role to play. But we now need to work in new combinations from the research, academic and expertise community to deliver the urgent action that we require and to do that in a fair and engaged way. Thank you so much, Alyssa. And it's my understanding that um, we're going to have Q&A at the end, and I already have some questions for you, but I'm sure the audience has loads as well. So our second speaker is Truen Resterich, who is the CEO of Hubbub, and I'm really looking forward to hearing more um, from the uh, local UK context about how the different people he is um, involved with have been approaching climate change in some really creative and um, interesting ways, definitely from the ground up um, as, as grassroots um, organizers. So uh, over to you, Truen. Thanks a lot, Colleen, and uh, thank you everybody for joining. Uh, just a quick introduction to Hubbub because I don't think we're quite as well known as the other parties here. Um, so yeah, we're an environment charity. I set it up uh, eight years ago as a sort of belated midlife crisis on my part um, to try and take uh, environmental messages to a mainstream audience. Uh, and we do that by talking about the things that we think people are passionate about. So the food they eat, the clothes they wear, the homes they live in and their neighborhoods and communities. Uh, we use what we think is great behavior change techniques and design. Uh, we collaborate with big business. Uh, we measure everything we do, and then we give away the results so that people can learn from our many mistakes and uh, steal the best bits. That's, that's, that's the ethos of, of the charity. So we're very much coming at this from how do you engage people, how do you engage communities to, to create change at a local level? Um, and I think one of the things that we realise is that the whole climate debate can seem very distant. It's, it's, you know, it comes from government, it comes from industry, it can feel a long way off and climate change itself is quite an abstract issue. It's very hard to see its relevance to the day to day for many people. Um, and it's still contentious. There are certain parties who want to build as much contention into the debate as they possibly can. So one of the first things that we've done uh, in this year of, of COP is to go out and, and survey the British public to, to get an understanding about where they're coming from, where, what's their view about climate change. Um, and there are a number of things that are happening. F first of all, concern about climate change in the UK is growing. Um, that concern has primarily been driven by extreme weather events. Um, we've all seen sort of the the, the fires, the drought, I think the one that really shocked people was the flooding in Europe, where even a very well developed nation like Germany really struggled to cope with, with the flood risk. So extreme weather is driving greater concern. A lot of documentaries filming, you know, the Attenborough effect has, has had a big impact, but also people mentioned COVID. And I think what COVID has done is shown that, that sort of the threats that are over the horizon that you might feel you can put off when they actually hit, they really hit. And people have realized that something like climate change could fall into that category. You know, it's, it's, a, it's on the horizon, but the impact could be absolutely significant. So concern is growing. 
and anxiety is growing. Um, so uh, the majority of people we survey don't believe that governments are going to hit the targets at, at, uh, at COP26. Um, and that anxiety is particularly strong amongst young people. Um, that they're, they're really concerned and the climate anxiety issue is, is definitely growing amongst the younger generation. Plus there's also confusion through the language that, that we're using around climate change. So 77% of the people we surveyed couldn't explain to a friend what net zero is, and yet it's a language that's used by government and companies all the time. Uh, and 38% had no idea what COP26 is, even though it's being held up as this sort of transformational moment. So, so, so there is confusion uh, ar around the language. Um, and half the people we surveyed just didn't feel that their actions could make any difference. This is a massive issue. What, what difference can I make? Uh, and or equally a half said, this is something for government and companies to sort out. It's got nothing to do with me. So we've got confusion and we've definitely got around half the population who feel disempowered completely because of the scale of the challenge. But what that does mean is that there's another half of the population who feel they can do something about it. And I think we're seeing growing uh, civil community action um, and that's being manifested in, in many different ways. So, you know, Obviously, Greta and the, the school strikes have really struck a chord uh, and really an authentic voice of young people saying we cannot go on like this. And it's incredibly hard for politicians to argue with that sort of movement, which has been so grassroots led, so authentically led. Uh, it's quite hard to argue to, with, with children that, that you're not stealing their future from them. So that's been a really powerful movement. Uh, and in the UK, we've seen Extinction Rebellion. Um, and what they've done is that they've really pushed this up the agenda. The climate assemblies that, that Lisa mentioned have definitely come through that. Um, but it can also be quite alienating to many people. So we've just seen recently with the blockading of uh, the M25 and, and, and major roads uh, by Insulate Britain, that that caused real aggravation. And also the way that the Extinction Rebellion operate, which is to put themselves forward for arrest, can be very disempowering to parts of the community who might be suffering sort of a threat of arrest on a daily basis, so the BAME communities. So, so although they've, they've really pushed the agenda forward in a good way in many ways, they can also be quite alienating and not for, for people. But there is another group who, who really want to see positive action and want to take positive action. Um, and actually what that group needs is a catalyst to help them get involved and, and to bring resources and skills and encouragement to, to the table uh, to help them turn their desire to act into action. And there's some unusual new players coming into this space. So an awful lot of businesses have been talking for a long time about their net zero target, et cetera, et cetera. But all of them have now realized, or many of them realized, you can't just set these abstract targets into the future. You have to do something now that is relevant to people. So we're certainly seeing uh, a lot of businesses stepping up to the plate now and saying, actually, we want to work with those community groups. We, we want to help them drive change. So one example, uh, uh, at Hubbub, is um, ar around food waste. So food waste was a country, it would be the third biggest climate emitting country in the world. So cutting food waste is obviously very important environmentally, but it's also helps people save money. Uh, it brings communities together. And we have a network of community fridges. So these are fridges and freezers where businesses take perishable and healthy food that would have been wasted. And then it's made freely available at no charge to everybody in the community. Um, and this sort of network of community fridges has sort of been slowly growing over two or three years. This year, the expansion has been enormous. It's more than doubled. So we now have over 200 community fridges with the co-op uh, sponsoring the growth of those fridges um, and I think that's a real indication that, that if you give people the resource and an idea, they will come together and, and do amazing things. Um, I think what's been really encouraging since uh, COVID in particular is that we're seeing a coming together of the social agenda and the environmental agenda. So uh, we run a campaign with uh, O2 called Community Calling. So the UK is the second biggest per capita producer of electronic waste. Uh, and yet we also have millions of people who are digitally isolated. They can't connect with their doctors, their friends, their carers. 
Um, so you have an environmental challenge and you have a social challenge. And community calling very simply asks people to donate their smartphones that are probably sitting in their drawers and their offices at work. Um, we physically and digitally clean them. And working with local charities, we redistribute them back to people who are isolated with a year's worth of free data. So, so I think this is a really interesting coming together of environmental and social issues. Um, and we're seeing that happening at a very grassroots level as well. So uh, at COVID, one of the things that people really relished was clean air, you know, in our cities. And we saw massive change in air quality in our cities. Um, and groups wanted to keep that. So we've been working with a group of Bangladeshi women uh, in Tower Hamlets in London uh, to, to look at what are the barriers that are preventing that, that group of women who want to cycle, what's actually preventing them from doing it. And it's social, it's clothing, it's their culture. Um, and what we found is that if you invest with and work with, with groups from, from a community such as that, you can very quickly get a cohort of people together, give them the strength to, to create change within their community. We've now set up a bike library so they, they can get safety equipment and they can get bikes for free so that they can cycle and store them safely. And I think we're starting to see the sort of grassroots momentum uh, building in communities. But obviously that can only go so far. And the, the question on this is, well, well, where's the power dynamic? So, you know, we're facing a huge climate challenge that everybody has to do everything they can as quickly as possible. So community action is essential, but how do you make that transformative? Uh, and I think there are two power levers that communities can have in, in, into the bigger sort of players, the influencers. One is through corporates. So what we've seen is that working uh, with community groups, um, we've managed to encourage Starbucks to actually start charging extra for disposable cups, paper cups uh, in their stores. Um, we persuaded Starbucks to add that cost. It didn't shift the number of sales uh, overall, but it doubled the amount of people using reusable cups. So you can shift a, a business uh, decision-making. And similarly with IKEA, uh, with a campaign we've done with their customers and their employees, which has now gone global, it's called Live Legom. We're seeing IKEA actually really force through sustainable change to their customer base. So I think there is influence that community groups can have with corporates. The big challenge is government and the, the, the multinational sort of parties. And, and we struggle really badly with that, trying to get community voices heard at a government and an international government level is, is incredibly difficult. And I think it's gonna be really interesting to see how the climate assemblies play out. You know, could they be the avenue that gives community a voice into government and into the international uh, conversations that need to take place? Um, I think it's a, a watch this space, but, but for me, that's, that's one of the more interesting areas to look at. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, um, Turun. So fascinating. I mean, I'm a Londoner, um, you know, by way of New York, um, and I feel like uh, I don't I, I don't hear enough positive sort of media, um, you know, broadcasting about grassroots organizing, and it's so inspiring to hear these stories of the Bangladeshi women in Tower Hamlets, which is you know, a very central London location, but nonetheless, in, in very diverse. Um, but it has everybody, it has like bankers, it has financial institutions, but it also has, you know, pretty impoverished, you know, estates, um, housing projects as we call them in the States. And wouldn't it be great if there were some way to provide more connectivity between the enormous wealth and the enormous need um, in a community like Tower Hamlets? But maybe Mustafa, who's actually at the UN in Geneva, could um, provide some insight into, you know, ways in which people from um, diverse and underrepresented communities can establish or um, amplify their voices on the international level. Uh, thank you. And first of all, um, uh, for the opportunity to, to join the conversation here. Um, I would like to start by saying a few words about the International Labour Organization. Uh, the IO is a very old uh, UN agency uh, set up just after the First World War. And one of the reasons at the foundation of the IO was that uh, there cannot be a lasting peace 
without social justice. Because there was this realization that one of the reasons that when like the war to that major war was just unacceptable levels of social injustice. Now, the IVA has also this unique feature as a UN agency, uh, which is that it is the only tripartite organization. Uh, typically, UN agencies have governments as their constituents. They, they lead the organization. They define the program and budget. Uh, they give orientation to the work of the organization, to the secretariat. Um, but when it comes to the ILO, this is done not only by representatives of governments, but also representatives of um, um, uh, uh, employee organizations, business, and uh, trade unions. And, and so um, in, in the UN language generally, there is this notion of stakeholders that you have somebody in charge of decision-making and that's governments, but there are others who have a stake uh, civil society, farmers group, women's group, and their stakeholders, they are consulted once in a while for their views, but at the end of the day, it is governments that decide. Now, when you come to the aisle, it's different. Uh, they are all decision makers, workers, employees, and governments, and they must work to find consensus around the issues. I just wanted to say, I used to work for the UN Environment Program, uh, where the governing body of the UNEP uh, was uh, just a few days. And when I arrived at the ILO, I found that the governing body would meet for two weeks. I was surprised what people could be talking about for such a long time. But then gradually I understand that if you put the real actors in the economy, workers, enterprises, uh, uh, employees, and governments to address real life situations, then you need time to build that consensus. Now, when it comes to the climate agenda, I think um, Alice has made a very good opening on the signs. And one point that we, from the signs of climate, is, is also that uh, climate change is caused uh, to a large extent by human activity. Um, so it is not just um, nature uh, in its um, way of functioning that leads uh, to greenhouse gas emissions. The large effect that we see now of, of warming has come out of the industrial revolution. And, and since human activity is keeping uh, pumping carbon and, and greenhouse gas into the atmosphere. Now, if we agree that human activity is one of the primary causes of climate change, then naturally uh, human uh, and people that we are must be part of that solution. If we don't change the way you know, we consume, we produce individually and collectively, it will be very difficult. Now, if you look at it from that point of view, then the world of work, which is essentially workers, enterprises, you know, all of us that actually make the economy function, engineers, road constructors, uh, farmers, et cetera, have a huge stake and a, a, a huge role to play. Now, this is even more so because when we look at the effects of climate change, it's an area where we've been quite interested in uh, at the ILO was the impact on jobs and people. Uh, a few years ago, we did an analysis looking at uh, what would be the impact of just continuing uh, this pattern of global warming, um, which the IPCC tells us leads to trillions of dollars of loss to the, to the global economy. But we wanted to understand what does global warming and heat stress mean in terms of occupational safety and health in the workplace and labor productivity. And what we find is that if the current patterns of warming go uncontrolled, if you, measure, if you measure it by 2030, on average, the work is going to lose about 2% of total working time, simply because it will be hot, too hot to work at certain times of the day. Now, when we say 2% of working time, it can be a very abstract number. However, if one turns that into full-time 
employment equivalency, it gives us a number of 80 million jobs. So it means that with just heat stress and the loss of labor productivity, the world is going to lose up to 80 million jobs by 2080. And this is going to be even more pronounced in certain regions like in West Africa or South Asia where the heat warming, the heat stress is much more prevalent. Where there we're talking of 5% of working time. Now, the other important element is that if you look closely at it, um, jobs depend on a healthy environment. We find that over 1 billion jobs really depend on healthy ecosystems. The clean air that we have, um, the fresh water that we breathe, the fertile land, the, the standing forest, these are all inputs in production processes, and that's what make job creation possible. So therefore, the more environmental degradation happens, the more we're going into what the union's uh, members used to like to say, uh, there, that there won't be any jobs on a debt fund. Now, this is why when I came to the I also found that uh, the uh, constituents that have been at the forefront of the climate agenda are trade unions. So I was a little confused at first because I thought that one would assume that workers would be worried about uh, climate action and, and measures that would actually may lead to loss of jobs. But it was the opposite. I think there was this thinking that if nothing is done to address climate change, we are heading towards that situation of no jobs on a dead planet. Now, I want to tell you, talk about the second, the, the other side of the coin, which is that uh, most analysis we've done tell us that ambitious climate action can lead to more and better jobs. Uh, the latest analysis we've run in 2018, looking at implementing the Paris Agreement on Climate Change, you know, with measures on energy efficiency, a larger use of renewable energy, a larger use of electric vehicles, we find that there is a potential to create up to 24 million jobs by 2030. So therefore, clearly, we are on a positive narrative. Now, where we see challenges is on the process of policymaking, because all these actors that can bring solutions that could be part of the solutions, the trade unions, the employees organizations, ministries of labor, they have not been fully involved to the extent that they should be in climate policy making uh, processes. So therefore there is this important effort to make sure that we have a much more inclusive um, process of policy making and, and implementing. And I also like to say what my friends in the unions like to say, which is that if you are not at the table, then you are the menu because people will deal about your issues and you have no say on it. So that's why we've been pushing a lot with this notion of social dialogue around climate change, uh, connecting the decent work agenda with the social agenda and the environmental agenda. I think this connection is, is quite instrumental. It will help build the consensus that we need within societies to reach the level of ambition that governments want to, risk, to, to achieve. And we see in countries where governments have taken ambitious climate measures without the necessary consultations, we have seen the consequences around the world. You face powerful forces of resistance and, and therefore a much more inclusive uh, process is what we, we're working on, uh, getting unions, employers and governments and communities work much more closely in defining and implementing climate um, policy issues. So I would like to discuss change more on these issues, but this notion of inclusion is critical and that's what can also lead to an important area of, of our work and, and, and advocacy, which is to have a just transition because we are also very clear that there is a positive narrative, but the transformative changes that we need and what, um, officials going to COP26 are looking for means massive social economic transformation. It will be painful. 
And it will not be possible to do that if we don't build the social consensus that we need. And that social consensus starts by having everybody uh, being around the table and being part of the game. That was um, fantastic, Mustafa. And it also really um, bridges very nicely to a conversation we were having, we were having um, just before we went on air in which Alyssa was talking about reskilling. And I had asked her a question regarding the ease with which corporates are reskilling workers who had been placed and are being productive in more conventional or traditional sort of energy production um, industries like gas and oil and how easy it is for them to make this transition. But I think the other problem that um, both you and Alyssa have raised, Mustafa, is that actually it's not just corporations which we should be looking to for inspiration or for you know to forge paths forward and just to put my two cents forward i would have to say that i also think that it is um the uh, responsibility of government to make sure that the right, right voices are being heard so we've all been hearing for a long time from very traditional and conventional sectors, industrial sectors, of the importance of retaining these jobs, semi-skilled, unskilled and skilled jobs relating to very you know, dirty or unhealthy industries, but shouldn't government also be ushering in a, um, a environment of inclusivity, of social justice and diversity, but also sort of starting to make that transition or that turn towards better kinds of industries, healthier industries, industries that are promoting um, clean um, and more productive, uh, you know, manufacturing, um, which account for not just the environmental, but also the social dimensions, um, which we've all been talking about um, towards not just uh, a cleaner mode of uh, manufacture or production, but also more inclusive and just. Um, so uh, Alyssa, if you wouldn't mind, I'm going to return to your talk um, very quickly. And um, just to sort of play a little bit more on the connectivity between, you know, what you were talking about and what Mustafa was talking about, but also bring in the diversity element, um, which Truen um, had been describing. So um, how can we transmit these technological innovations and scientific innovations from the first world and bring them to bear on third world economies in a productive way that help um, you know, other kinds of economies to you know, produce and create um, more healthier and environmentally friendly um, economies? Okay, wow. There's, I mean, I guess a lot you could say here. Um, I'll start by saying what exists already. So the international framework on climate change, as I said, it's quite structured and there are some mechanisms and agreements there. And included in that is something called technology transfer mechanism. Um, and that's a deliberate structure that's there recognizing in some of these negotiations over the past 26 years, um, it was recognized that this is something important, that actually being able to share the technologies themselves um, across borders in all different directions is a very valuable thing. And so there is a part of the discussions that happen, as well as the negotiations that will get high profile on how strongly people should reduce greenhouse gas emissions. There will be a series of conversations around technology and what's called capacity building, which is sharing knowledge on how to do some of these things from countries that have done it to countries that have yet to do it. So there is some structure there. Um, now, underpinning that, though, you, you could go a lot further and say there's some other things that we also need to do, obviously. So one of them is that to be able to do that technology transfer and that capacity building, even within that framework, you need to make sure that you have sufficient finance to support those activities. So that's one part of the international negotiations that focuses on what's called climate finance. Um, and that will be this figure that people will, might recognize of $100 billion, which was committed in Paris from developed to developing nations to support a whole load of things, some of which could include this. Okay, so you need some finance. But then you could also think beyond the structures that already exist. As I said, those governance structures are there, but they're probably not sufficient. 
Um, so a few other interesting things that people might want to hear about. First of all, um, not all of that learning ought to come from this structure of sharing technology from wealthy to poor or established to not established yet. Um, and there's, a, there's a, a great group of universities that are promoting South-South learning in this kind of capacity building effort um, between different um, developing country and emerging economy universities so that they actually try and share this knowledge and technology and, and build capacity that's homegrown um, and led by those countries as part of this effort to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and also to adapt to the impacts of climate change where different kind of processes and context relevant solutions are really required. So that's quite exciting. And there's opportunities though, for people in kind of networks of networks, other groups of international experts to plug into that, but without taking it over. Um, I think that's, that's obviously, um, some, well, obviously, but can sometimes be a challenge. Um, and the other part of the story, which falls outside the framework of the negotiations and the climate change discussions themselves, but is really important is also, you know, how are we, let's say in the UK, I'm in the UK academic sector, making sure that we're sufficiently supporting, helping grow our own sector in those parts of the world. So that what we'll start to see is ideas, solutions, but also entrepreneurs, entrepreneurship, um, and, the, and the sort of um, expansion of those and application of those technologies being done by people who come from those countries and understand those contexts best. Um, some of that can be done through scholarship programs, but also making sure that we're helping to build up the academic sector in those places. So I know I've, I've answered that in kind of quite a university heavy fashion, but those are the examples that are closest to my fingertips. Thank you so much, Alyssa. But I also think that that, you know, really provides a nice um, connection to um, what Truen was discussing with respect to opportunities for corporate engagement in this space for sponsorship. Um, and also, you know, maybe there's the scope or opportunity to promote um, local entrepreneurship, um, you know, and there has been the example which he um, had already provided us with respect to Tower Hamlets. So my um, specific question for Truen was, um, you know, whether there's any resource out there um, aside from Hubbub or maybe through Hubbub that enables corporates or larger organizations to source appropriate um, partnership, uh, you know, with local communities or local initiatives? So I think one of the, the so two, well, two key words have just keep coming up again and again uh, as with businesses when they start to realize the enormity of the challenge that they face. What, what, one is the need to collaborate. So businesses have increasingly realized they can't solve this individually on their own. It's just too big, it's too expensive, it's too vast. And what we're starting to see is that businesses have also realized that they can't collaborate with people just within their sector. They need to collaborate more broadly. So I think we are starting to see the, the fruition of, of true cross-sector collaborations where businesses say, well, we can bring this to the party, the civil society can bring this, um, government needs to bring this. And, and I think there, there is a growing sort of recognition that, that it's that sort of collaborative approach is happening. And, and I think COVID sped that up. We saw a lot of companies starting to make very rapid changes in their investment policies, investing in local communities, investing in their frontline workers, thinking about the vulnerable. So I think there is, there is a, a broad shift there towards greater collaboration. And the other word that keeps coming up is resilience, is that the, the, the extreme weather events we've seen and, and all of the, the shocks uh, to, to the climate and also through COVID has, has meant that businesses are changing the narrative to around, we need to build long-term resilience into our business. Now, resilience can be quite a short-term thing, which we need to cut costs and you know make, make sure we can sort of survive financially. But I think resilience in name of business is now is much more long-term it's much more strategic and it's thinking globally. So, you know, we're starting to see businesses think, crikey, if climate change happens, what happens to our supply chain? What happens if there are it's extreme drought in, in Africa? What happens, you know, if there's super poor air quality in China? We, we need to think about our, our complete supply chain with, with the, the view of resilience. And that means they're having to think globally. And that means they're having to think about who are the authentic voices in those communities we need to talk with? Now, 
it's still very much a pipe dream that would, you know, it's, there's only a few heading down that route. But, but I, I think that that is really encouraging. The, the other thing I'd just like to say, building on what Mustafa said, um, is that we have to be honest about this transition. Any, any period of change, like the one we're gonna go through, will have winners and losers. Um, and we're very good at talking about, oh, there'll be winners, there'll be green jobs, but there are also industries that are gonna lose out. You know, there, there, there are people whose livelihoods uh, are gonna be severely affected. And, and all of us as decision makers and, and policy leads need to think about who's gonna lose out and how do we make that transition as smooth as possible to a different way of living, to a different economy. Because if you look at the people who are fighting the changes, if you're looking at what's happening in countries like Brazil, it's those who feel really at threat in their day-to-day -day livelihoods who are hanging on to an unsustainable way of working. So we need to be honest about winners and losers. And I, and I don't think the climate debate is very good at that. Thank you so much, Tarun. And thank you so much also for referring back to Mustafa's points. Unfortunately, Cameron isn't able to make it this evening. And so we're not going to be able to talk about um, disability rights um, to the extent that I had wanted to. Um, but luckily, Mustafa is on hand to um, provide us with some insight into, um, you know, the problems relating to industrialization. And so he was talking about um, specifically, you know, um, while it's on the one hand, we can think about this in a natural sciences capacity. You know, there are also specific problems relating to industrialization. And I was wondering if um, he could maybe shed some light on if there are different types of climate um, problems which are faced by countries which are not as heavily industrialized um, as first world countries, or if indeed first world countries can look to um, less industrialized contexts for solutions. Well, I, I think there are different pathways to development and, and certainly the debate today is that uh, uh, countries that are uh, like emerging economies and, and those in, in development uh, have an opportunity to learn from the experience of industrialized countries of today and not to repeat necessarily the same pathway um, to, um, to, to, to economic development, if you like. I think there is now a very clear view that there is no one linear pathway to, 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 to human well-being. There are many different ways uh, to improve well-being. Uh, industrialization is, is, is certainly important, but uh, the process of industrialization itself today is very different from what it was uh, several decades ago. And I think this is also thanks to technology, there is much less resource uh, and energy intensity in production processes. We need less inputs uh, per um, uh, unit of energy to produce a good uh, or service that uh, compared to uh, several decades ago. But, but obviously this is also what uh, what Alisa was referring to, the question of technology, how to make that the clean technologies available to across the, the war. Um, but I wanted to also mention that uh, climate impacts on, on different, uh, in different ways uh, uh, on, on countries and, and, and communities. You can just imagine um, those economies that depend so much on tourism, uh, be it Comoros, be it Maldives, Mauritius, um, uh, they are very sensitive to any measure that is taken uh, to cut down emissions in aviation, including taxing. You know, but some of the measures that governments are taking is just in introducing taxation, uh, raising the cost of travel, airfare, et cetera, which is important and, and part of the effort on mitigation, but they do have extraterritorial effects because they will impact on economies that depend on, on tourism. So in the same way, um, uh, when there are measures to uh, import products like wine, I know South Africa has been concerned about uh, measures to, for them to export wine in bulk rather than in bottles, because that of, at, altogether reduces the carbon footprint of that export. But 
in the economy, it, it impacts significantly on the supply chain, on the production process, and there are jobs at, at risk. So therefore, um, there are um, many layers of, of, of complication. Um, but I would just want to, to, to end by saying that um, there is uh, a need for a comprehensive set of policies. You know, what we talked about um, uh, on technology, on financing, um, uh, and, 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 and mitigation uh, should not be the only elements of the climate package. Um, there is a range of uh, policies on skilling, you know, upskilling uh, people, because without the right skills, the potential for green jobs is not going to be materialized. On the other hand, uh, if there are not policies to help redundant workers, say in the coal uh, and uh, fossil fuel industry to be able to enter occupations in the green space, uh, we would not have that smooth transition and that could lead to social uh, disruption. Um, there is also an important role for social protection. Uh, we're now looking very much how social protection could be not only scaled, uh, because we have to remember that today only 30% of people around the world have an adequate social security. Um, and, and so when we have um, natural disasters in regions like Asia, in the Philippines or other countries where farmers, fishermen are impacted, many of those have no social security. So, um, you know, the loss of their business assets means no income, no food. So therefore we find that uh, making social protection uh, wide and, and, and effective in itself is an important instrument of resilience against climate change. And then second, how do we align social protection measures with the climate risk? Because we will see this increasing risk for people, for businesses and workers and communities. So therefore, these, these are all elements of social labor market policy, that need to come in the climate space and be part of the policies that, that address climate change. So that it's not just an environmental agenda, just discussions about mitigation, technology finance, but the social policies that respond to the needs of people, of workers and communities and enterprises have to be fully part of uh, this agenda. Thank you so much for that very thorough and insightful answer, Mustafa.